Kirtland, Ohio, a small community, quiet and serene. And yet, what took place here over 150 years ago has made Kirtland a prominent place in certain minds and hearts throughout the world. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world consider this rural community an important part of their history. And for good reason. Kirtland was the first official gathering place for members of the church shortly after its organization in 1830. Why the Latter-day Saints came to Kirtland, what they did, and why they left is the unique and fascinating story we are about to tell. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How did it first come into being? For the answer, we must go east of Kirtland to another small village, that of Palmyra, New York. The year, 1820. At this particular time, Western New York State was experiencing a period of intense religious revivalism. Preachers from many denominations were holding spirited camp meetings, competing for new members. You know, there are those who say, you've got to do thus and so to be saved. Amen. We were either saved or we were damned. That's all there is to it. Right now is the time for you to declare your faith by baptism as to whose side you are really on. Just outside of Palmyra, a family by the name of Smith lived on a modest farm. One of the Smith children, a 14-year-old young man named Joseph, was confused about which church he should join. While studying the family Bible, Joseph came across this scripture in the first chapter, fifth verse of the epistle of James in the New Testament. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. This scripture made a deep impression on Joseph. Believing it with all his heart, he went to a grove of trees near his father's farm to ask of God in prayer. It was on the morning of a beautiful clear day, early in the spring of 1820. Finding a secluded spot, he knelt down and began to pray. He later recorded, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. I no sooner gained possession of myself than I asked the personages which of all the churches was right, and which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong and that none were acknowledged by God as his church and kingdom. And I was expressly commanded to go not after them, at the same time receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel would at some future time be made known unto me. Three years after this extraordinary event, Joseph was visited by another heavenly messenger. An angel named Moroni told him of an ancient scripture engraved on metal plates which lay buried in a nearby hill. The angel said the record contained an account of the ancient inhabitants of the American continent and the writings of the prophets who lived among them. Four years later, Joseph was permitted by the angel to take the record from the hill. Joseph translated it by the gift and power of God. The record is called the Book of Mormon, named after the ancient American prophet historian who compiled most of its contents. In 1829, other heavenly messengers came. John the Baptist appeared as a resurrected being and conferred upon Joseph and his scribe Oliver Cowdery the authority to baptize. One month later, Christ's three chief apostles, Peter, James, and John, were sent to give to Joseph and Oliver additional priesthood powers and authority 
and to authorize them to restore the true church of Jesus Christ to the earth. The Lord even directed the specific day that the church was to be organized, and on April 6, 1830, in a log farm home near the village of Fayette, New York, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints officially came into existence. This was not a new church. It was a restoration of the church that Jesus organized when he was on the earth. The restored church of Jesus Christ had all the authority and elements of Christ's original church. It was directed by the Lord himself, who revealed his mind and will to a living prophet as in biblical times. It had the power to bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost. It practiced baptism by immersion. It also operated on the divine principle of continuous revelation. Joseph received many important revelations from God, most of which are compiled in a book entitled The Doctrine and Covenants, which the Church accepts as Scripture. One of these revelations received by Joseph in December of 1830 commanded that the Church move to Ohio. Accordingly, in January of 1831, the prophet, along with his wife and several other church members, boarded a horse-drawn sleigh and set out for Kirtland, where Mormon missionaries had reported great success in previous months. Their first stop upon arriving in Kirtland was the Newell K. Whitney store. Joseph entered and extended his hand to the man behind the counter. Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. Somewhat bewildered, the merchant replied, You have the advantage of me, sir. I could not call you by name, as you have me. I am Joseph, the prophet. You prayed me here. Now what do you want of me? It is said that the prophet, while in the east, had seen the Whitneys in vision, praying for his coming to Kirtland. Soon after Joseph's arrival, Kirtland was designated as the official gathering place for members of the church. As converts began pouring in, this small town became the hub of church activity and would remain so for seven years, from 1831 to 1838. During this time, the saints built many homes and settled large portions of land. They erected stores, mills, an ashery, a tannery, and a school as well as an inn for travelers. Many of these buildings can still be seen today. For a time, Joseph and his family lived in the John Johnson home in Hiram, a community 30 miles southeast of Kirtland. Then in 1832, Newell K. Whitney offered part of his store as a home for Joseph and his wife Emma. Gratefully, Joseph accepted, and a carpenter was employed to remodel the upstairs into a residence, office, and meeting room. The meeting room was used for the School of the Prophets, where classes were held in theology and English grammar. Eventually, the curriculum included political science, literature, geography, ancient languages, and the sciences. One day in 1833, while the School of the Prophets was convened, Joseph noticed the dirty spittoons and tobacco smoke that filled the room. Wondering if such an atmosphere was conducive to the Spirit of the Lord, Joseph inquired of the Lord concerning the use of tobacco. In response, he received a revelation wherein the Lord advised against the use of tobacco, as well as alcohol and hot drinks such as tea and coffee. The revelation also recommended a well-balanced diet, particularly the use of whole grains and fresh fruits and vegetables. The Lord promised increased health and vigor to those who would abide by His counsel. More than a century of compliance to this revelation, known as the Word of Wisdom, has produced a remarkably healthy people. Recent studies have shown that Mormons live longer than the population as a whole, and that their death rate from heart attacks and cancer is one-half the national average. In addition to improved physical health, Mormons who live this principle find they also experience a special closeness to the Lord, a benefit which can accompany obedience to His commandments. It was also in the Whitney store that the Church's extensive welfare system had its beginnings. After being called as one of the first bishops in the Church, 
Newell K. Whitney consecrated his store to the service of the church, and it became a distribution center of goods to the poor. Today, hundreds of modern warehouses have replaced Bishop Whitney's building, but the principle remains the same. The funds and labor for the welfare system are all donated by church members out of a concern for the poor and needy. For one and a half years, Joseph and Emma lived in the upper west end of the Whitney store. It was here that their first surviving child, Joseph III, was born November 6, 1832. It was also here that Joseph received many important revelations from the Lord. One of these received Christmas Day, 1832, was a prophecy concerning the Civil War. The Lord told Joseph that South Carolina would take the initiative in the conflict and that the ensuing war would bring death and misery to many souls. The Lord also revealed that the South would appeal to Great Britain and other nations for aid and that this war would be only the beginning, that nation would rise against nation until war would be poured out upon all. This was prophesied by Joseph and recorded nearly 30 years before the first shot was fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. In May of 1833, another important revelation was received by the prophet. The Lord commanded the church to build a house of God, a temple in Kirtland. In this temple, the Lord said, he would endow the members of his church with power from on high. For the young, struggling church, it was an overwhelming assignment. Most of its members were in the depths of poverty. But Joseph had a motto, when the Lord commands, do it. And so they did. This was to be no ordinary building, but a temple built of quarried stone with an interior of finely crafted wood. Timber was cut and milled. Iron was forged. The carpet and drapery were made by the women. Stone was cut and hauled from nearby quarries where the actual drill marks made nearly a century and a half ago can still be seen at one of these sites just south of the village. Brigham Young, a skilled carpenter and recent convert to the church, superintended the labor on the interior of the building. It was this same Brigham Young who many years later would lead the church to the Salt Lake Valley and become its second president. Enemies of the church threatened to destroy the partially constructed temple and to kidnap Joseph Smith. Therefore, it was necessary for the laborers on the temple to stand guard at night to protect the walls from being torn down. On March 27, 1836, three years after it was commenced, the Kirtland Temple was dedicated by the Prophet Joseph Smith. About 1,000 saints filled the seats and aisles of the building. Following the dedicatory prayer by the Prophet, a hymn, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning, which was written especially for the occasion, was sung by the choir. Meetings in the temple continued through the day and into the night, William Draper, a member of the church who was present at the dedication, wrote, My pen is inadequate to write it in full or my tongue to express it. But I will here say that the spirit was poured out and came like a mighty rushing wind and filled the house, that many that were present spoke in tongues and had visions and saw angels and prophesied and had a general time of rejoicing such as had not been known in this generation. Of this transcendent event, Joseph recorded in his journal, The people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. This continued until the meeting closed at 11 p.m. One week later, on the afternoon of April 3, 1836, the prophet, along with Oliver Cowdery, knelt by the pulpit on the west side of the temple and bowed themselves in solemn prayer. Upon arising, a glorious vision was opened to their view. They beheld the Lord Jesus Christ standing upon the pulpit, 
Joseph wrote that his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and that his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters. The Savior told Joseph and Oliver that he accepted the sacrifice of the saints in building this temple. Then the prophets Moses, Elias, and Elijah appeared and bestowed upon Joseph and Oliver important keys and authority, among which were the keys of the sealing powers. This sealing power is the same authority the Lord bestowed upon Peter when he said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. It is this power that makes possible the performance of eternal marriages in temples today. This bestowal of the sealing power also gave birth to the Church's interest in genealogical research, since this authority allows members to perform baptism, eternal marriage, and other important ordinances for their deceased ancestors as well. While the Church was headquartered at Kirtland, missionaries took the gospel to every state in the Union, as well as to Canada and Great Britain. Many thousands of people joined the Church during this brief span of seven years. But persecution eventually became so intense that the saints were forced to flee Kirtland. Missouri had been designated by the prophet as the new gathering place for the church, and it was to this western fringe of the nation that the saints fled. By 1838, many of the saints had left Kirtland. The temple, considered one of the largest and finest buildings in western America, had been completed, dedicated, and abandoned all within two years. But rather than escaping persecution, the saints found even more of it in Missouri. Fleeing their persecutors, members of the church eventually left Missouri and founded the city of Nauvoo on the banks of the Mississippi River in Illinois. But on June 27, 1844, a group of armed men shot and killed Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram while they were being held in a jail in nearby Carthage, Illinois. Further mob violence forced the saints to abandon their homes and to leave this area too. In 1846, they made their way west under the direction of Joseph's successor, Brigham Young, to settle in the Great Salt Lake Valley. From there, they established over 500 communities throughout the Intermountain West. Since that time, the message of Mormonism has gone to all the world and temples have been erected in many lands. Just as a handful of missionaries left Kirtland nearly 150 years ago to spread the message of the restored gospel, so today thousands of them leave their homes at their own expense to spread the same message. And wherever the story of Mormonism is told, Kirtland is remembered with reverence as the first gathering place of the Lord's Church in modern times.